We'll go ahead and get us started. We're going to be talking about zero trust today. Joe, you know anything about zero trust you can help us with? Uh, maybe. Maybe. I <laughs> just made <laughs> fantastic. Well, we, we appreciate you. And this is one of the hottest topics that we that we do at Gov Brief. So many people interested in this from the differences and the difficulties and confusion of it all over the place. So this this is your great company if you're here because they these are all the agencies that are winding up being here today. So we we appreciate you joining us. And this will be the best briefing ever. You're not going to believe this, Joe. If Dave comes away with actionable information on addressing federal mandates on zero trust. So got, that's what Dave needs. Paulette, how zero trust architecture will be implemented. Lots about that. Ken's talking about implement ZT and priorities to focus on first. And Philip talking about getting an understanding of zero trust. Confusing, right, Joe? A little bit Can of confusion. Be. Can be. Yeah. Uh, Joshua from CMS, I learned about zero trust, implement it again. Catherine, I can understand what to look for when procuring IT solutions that include zero trust models. That's an interesting one. You might be able to talk about that. I have a surprise any, any... for that one. <laughs> That's right. Uh, <coughs> William, uh, it makes me think differently of how to approach zero, zero trust. That's good. Hopefully we'll make you think a little bit. <laughs> Diane, uh, templates are available of required documents. I'm not sure about that one. Uh, Dean, uh, but the, actually there are there. There's some templates about what to do, right, Joe? At least what the, it's coming out of the, the agencies, right? Yep. Yep. We'll Dean, find them. If we understand how to build an ICAM program for a federal agency, all righty. And then please address, so which account types are included or not included in this policy? Joe, you want to take that one right out of the gate? Uh, sure. Every account. Every account. Every All account. of them. All of it. Uh, Frank, the best way to bolster knowledge and effect, uh, quickly and effectively for support techs. Love that idea. Uh, how does an agency begin to implement a, a federal ICAM program? That's an interesting one. Dean from FTC came from the other one, too, I guess. Uh, Abraham from FEMA. How long, how long could it take for government agencies to be compliant with zero trust initiatives? Well, that's a, that's a loaded question, don't you think? Mm -hmm. um, Wilbert, is ZT going to be included as part of CDM package? Uh, we'll, get, we'll see about that one. And Paulette, what is the impact of ZTA on legacy systems? Impact, yes. Uh, Eric, uh, why now and not before? And what does an EO directive tell us? Great question. <coughs> Uh, John from Census, is there a reference architecture and best practices document? All of those are good, aren't they, Joe? Yep, they all fit in. They all fit in. And hopefully we'll be able to address those. If we don't, we're going to come back around to them and we'll be able to, to do that. Joe Norton, uh, Senior Fellow with Divine's Digital Risk and Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. There we go. Uh, Laszlo, who was going to join us today, is not here today. So I'll, I'll be pinch hitting a little bit. I can't match Laszlo, just saying, Joe, can't do it. But uh, but uh, if there's anything that we need to pull him in on, we will do that, right, Joe? Certainly will. Yeah, Not a problem. Not a problem. Uh, we will talk, get you introduced to Joe and, and what he's all about, give you the briefing controls. What is zero trust and what is not? Love that. Uh, federal mandates and initiatives on zero trust. We'll talk about why this is coming down on folks' heads. Somebody mentioned that earlier and areas and agencies expecting to make progress by 2024. So the question is not uh, how long it can take, is when it should be done, right, to make progress. And pitfalls and traps in implementing zero trust. Part of this today, you will have session docs that will be posted up that you will have access to. You have the briefing presentation. There's a DOD ZTA handout and ZTA capabilities. For you guys today, if you've been living under a rock and you have no idea how Zoom works, I can't imagine that's the case, you can go up top and pick that little side-by-side -side mode and make uh, Joe bigger or smaller. If you don't like the way he looks or doesn't like that 22-mile picture in the background, you can make him disappear altogether if you want. Uh, and participation is easy and encouraged. You'll have docs. They'll be put into the chat just like they were. If you have questions, let's try our best to keep them in the raise hand mode or the Q and A. And if you have something that you don't want anybody else in the world to see, then pop it in and, and send it to that email address or call the phone number that's down there that we'll get to Shantanu, who's also here and he'll be able to answer those questions or funnel it to somebody that can, right Shantanu? You bet. <laughs> you bet. 
A quick disclaimer, this not is not, you're not going to believe this either, Joe. This event is not affiliated or endorsed by GSA. We have to say this so that you guys can participate uh, it, or any other agencies provided to the audience for informational purposes only. And all participation by you in this briefing is voluntary, not an endorsement to buy or purchase from Divine or any other vendor. How do you like that? So the real question we have today is where are you in your zero trust journey and that journey is just collecting information. You got a bunch of folks that are just asking, how, and what is this thing all about? And are you budgeted for readiness assessment? If you don't know what that is, you probably shouldn't check it. Um, and actively designing the solution, implementation started, looking for help or adoption underway and don't need help. There you go. So we'll, we'll leave that open for just a minute. Any questions that are out there before we even get started? We had a bunch that, that, of the folks that were there. Uh, Andrew, Matthew, Ray, Matthew, you there, Matthew? Yes, hello. You, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Matthew, who are you with? I'm with Pulsar Informatics. Hello. Oh, very nice to meet you, man. So what, you got a quick one before we get started? Yeah, just a quick one. It doesn't have to be answered, but I just would like to request that the answer be worked into your presentation as we move forward. How does Zero Trust compare to and contrast with CMMC? All right. There you go, Joe. First question. Thanks, Matthew. Appreciate that, man. Awesome. And I'm going to put, I'm going to lower that hand. If we don't get to that or answer that in some form or fashion, put your hand back up. We'll make sure we get to it. All right. So here we go. Let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, divine while this is open, but tell us a little bit about divine. Uh, that's how you, you say that D I V I H N divine and Shantanu is with divine. Tell us a little bit about you guys. Hey, uh, thanks Dave. Um, thanks for the high energy uh, kickoff uh, here. So, so uh, we are in business, uh, a Chicago based firm uh, in business about 20, uh, 20 plus uh, years, 20, running our 21st uh, our primary uh, competencies are in enterprise cloud, on-prem, and cybersecurity uh, areas. What makes us uh, unique, uh, essentially, is we we bring uh, IP-driven service model. So we are not for billing as many hours as our consultants can. We are about reusing the uh, IP that we bring and reduce the billable hours. And that, that what's, uh, that's what distinguishes us with our customers and with our partners. We have several big four primes as our uh, partners as well. While we do that, we are an active uh, contributor in the community, member of uh, FBI, in uh, you know actively in Chicago area, uh, have worked for uh, National 911, doing some you know, pro bono work, etc. In addition to uh, the social community nonprofit work and other engagements that we are often invited to speak at on the all matters cybersecurity, analytics, uh, and more. We are a minority-owned business, uh, SBA, uh, Small Business Administration 8A. So th that's uh, another point to mention. So with that, uh, I know you all are excited and keen about hearing uh, Joe talk, which who coincidentally has, uh, uh, as a chief uh, security officer, has ran two Summer Olympic Games. He doesn't like to talk about that, but uh, you know, physical and cyber security of two Olympic games in, and some Paris bombing and whatnot. So you, you had to meet him at the bar someday, you know, that way you, you, you get to hear all those cool stories. Yeah. And, and, he, and Joe is full of cool stories, not the least of which yeah. is, is this picture. And while I'm sharing this uh, with you, I'm gonna um, hand this off to you, Joe, so that you can take it from here. And, uh, and I'll pop back in from time to time with polls or if, if there's questions, I'll be glad to help coordinate. But Joe, you can take it from here. I'm gonna stop my sharing and oh, maybe I, I don't even have to. Look at you, you got it all. all I think I got it. There. there you go. There we go. Cool, everybody can see it, I hope. Um, I just was very intrigued in um, <clears throat> looking at the first poll and uh, interesting, 82% of you who are here today responded by saying you're in information collection. 1% um, or 2%, somewhere in between there, 
1% in active design of, of ZTA solutions, 2% in budgeting, uh, 2% in uh, looking for implementation to help someplace, 1% uh, active, don't need any help. That's kind of interesting profile for attendees. I'm going to take this off the screen or at least off my screen. Uh, I got you. I just wanted to share it for everybody to see. Yeah, yeah. So that's an interesting set of profiles for everybody here. And it's a lead into this slide. Now, I was talking with Dave earlier, and uh, he was always, again, reminding me how much he likes this picture, which as a photographer, if any of you are photographers out there, I had the opportunity to last fall to uh, get out to the Susquehanna River to the Conowingo Dam. So if you're a photographer, if you're into wildlife, um, the Conowingo Dam is a great place if you want to capture images in flight of bald eagles. It's probably one of the better ones in the United States uh, outside of Alaska. And this was an image I caught uh, when I was there. Um, and if the lead in to ZTA is, do you want to be the eagle or the fish? <laughs> it's that simple, guys. Um, you're either going to get beat up by this or uh, you're going to get ahead of the curve and you're going to be the eagle eating the fish instead, right? So so where does this stuff come from? Where are we? All right, why isn't my screen moving? Go, there we go. So why are we here? Back in May 2021, Executive Order Improving Nation's Cybersecurity on May 12, 2021. Back last September, OMB drafted a federal strategy for moving our U.S. government towards a zero trust architecture. And it's interesting. This is like the third or fourth time I've given this webinar. And uh, every time the question comes up, why now? Why now? And just to be blunt, if you don't know why, I, I don't know if I can help you because if, if you're in cybersecurity, even if you're not in cybersecurity, if you're just in any, any role in IT, you know why, and you know why now. The entire world is under attack uh, from a cybersecurity perspective with ransomware and data breaches and everything else. And uh, it's just escalating and escalating. So it's about time. I was so happy when this executive order came out to say, hey, maybe finally we're gonna start paying attention to this stuff. Uh, back in January, the presidential uh, memorandum in January 19th, OMB further guidance in January 26th, defining where to go, how to, how to get there, what we expect, what the timelines are. Now, here we are in May 2022. So the executive order is a year old. We're a year into this. So it's kind of interesting to see the profile from the start of the executive order to where agencies are today. So if we look at the original executive order 14028, okay, there are a number of sections in that. The actually nine specifically, foster a more secure cyberspace in our federal government, remove barriers to sharing information about threats, modernize the federal government cybersecurity, Enhancing our software supply chain, get out the weak links, safety review boards for cyber, standardize the playbook on responding to cybersecurity vulnerability and active incidents. Detection, okay. Um, how do we investigate and remediate? And then what are our primary national security systems that just must be enhanced and protected? Now, while all of this is in the executive order, the only thing I will be speaking to today is number three, modernizing the federal government cybersecurity. And within that, I will only be speaking to zero trust architecture, okay? So when we look at the imperatives on cybersecurity, it's adopt best practices, advancement towards zero trust architecture, which is kind of ambiguous, right? Advance towards. Well, if you dig in, there are some specific timelines to achieve stuff. Accelerate security and cloud services and movement to secure cloud services, which is some people will tell you that's an oxymoron. Others will tell you it's the only thing to do and it's the best thing since sliced bread. Centralize and streamline your access to data across your agencies. 
and with CISA drive analytics and invest in technology and personnel to match these goals. That's what I got enthusiastic about. I got enthusiastic about all of it, especially zero trust architecture. But the fact that the executive order focuses on investments in what tools you need and people, which is all about budgeting or reprioritizing your existing budgets and monies. All right. More background. How do you move towards this to specific zero trust security goals? The focus for zero trust security goals are an identity enterprise, identity management, multi-factor authentication, complete inventories of your devices, and your ability to detect and respond to incidents. Implementing encryption at rest and encryption in transit in your networks. And on your application level, whether it's legacy applications, new applications, software as a service, web-facing applications out of your own data center, everything. Treat your applications as if they are connected directly to the internet. Test them for external vulnerabilities and provide vulnerability reports and share that information, make it visible. And then on the data side, start building your pathway to protect data, deal with data categorization, logging and information sharing. Zero trust architecture is all about enterprise-wide identity. Let me say that again. Zero trust architecture is all about enterprise-wide identity. Okay, who's affected? I get, we got asked this question in the past. Everybody is affected. Every agency in our federal government is affected by this and should be well into your plans by now. Basic timeline, so you can see my face shift because I'm looking at a bigger screen so I can see all this stuff and I hope you can all see that. You know, how many days for specific reactions on agency specific directions in NSM 8? And then look at the dates in the chart within the unit who, what actions, notify, provide, review, identify, et cetera, and what the due dates going back to January 27th this year. Determination of the when, recommendations to CNSS, policies and provide feedback, process for assisting agencies through uh, February and into April, plan to start implementing ZTA and share that, have it developed, submit your plan to CNSS. Uh, guidance issued by OMB, established procedures to share information, et cetera. This has all been published and is available to your agencies, your timelines that are there. As you move into April, get your feedback. And where it starts getting hard is in July, implement or at least begin your implementation of multi-factor authentication. And, any, and I'm going to be able to identify all your instances of unencrypted or not encrypted information, et cetera. So this is not meant in this webinar to go through every deliverable for every agency, but these are some of the highlighted um, timelines that have been published as directives to each of your agencies. It's aggressive. Yes, it's aggressive. Okay. So we go back to zero trust, but before I go there, I just want to back up a little bit, right? And if you forgive me, I don't want to make you dizzy, but I am going to back up to the timeline. When you look at this, you're saying, well, I'm one year into this. Where am I? How long will this take? That will come forward as we speak about what zero trust is. So zero trust provides for a collection, and this is a definition right out of the NIST publication 800-207, right? Collection of concepts and ideas designed to minimize uncertainty and enforcing accurate, least privilege per request access decisions in your information systems and services and networks. Now, let me repeat that. Least privilege per request access decisions. That's what zero trust is. So does it have an 
all of the old style stuff that we've had floating around IT for dozens and dozens of years that says, hey, single sign on, once you're on, et cetera, um, that's okay. It's not okay anymore, all right? It's not okay for somebody to log into their desktop, leave it up and running, walk away, go to lunch, come back and say, hey, I don't have to log in again. It's too much of a hassle to log in. This is about per request, least privilege access decision. Trust no access and test it every time to see that it's a valid access request. The other piece of this definition is collection of concepts and ideas. So back to the earlier questions that were on the slides about what, what would make this the best ever. Can you answer these questions? You cannot buy zero trust out of the box. If you have a vendor trying to sell you, I have the perfect solution for zero trust, run away. It doesn't <laughs> exist. Okay, it's that simple. It's a collection of things you do to verify trust. So what is zero trust and what is it not? It is definitely not a commercial off-the-shelf or COTS product or solution. It's also not a solution for zero-day vulnerabilities. It just isn't. There's still vulnerabilities. It's still going to be attacks. There's still going to be successful attacks. Is zero trust going to stop every breach attempt? Absolutely not. But it's going to take you a long way there. I'm going to ask a question now, but I don't want anybody to answer it. I want you to hold this in the back of your head, and then I'll ask it again at the end of the webinar. What is the largest cause of cybersecurity breaches that exists today? What is the largest cause of cybersecurity breaches that exist today? We'll come back to that at the end of the webinar. 100% cloud adoption is not going to get you zero trust. If you don't have zero trust implemented, what makes you think your vendors do? So that's where we talk about getting out to the third party supply chain and the fourth parties and the fifth parties and the sixth parties. And also zero trust does not make you recovery ready in the event of an incident. Okay, so how do you start? You start with the philosophy and culture that you don't trust. You test for least privilege access every time. That's what it is. How you implement that is dependent upon your systems and your tools, your philosophy and your architectures that you develop within your own agencies. The core principles are a, based around a holistic model for your devices, applications, network data and identities of your people and your access and your machine identities. Notice I said machine identities. It's not only people focused on identity-centric policy model to control your access. The three core principles are here. This is what's behind the philosophy. Ensure all resources are accessed securely regardless of location. Adopt least privilege, strictly enforce access control, and inspect and log all traffic. Inspect and log all traffic, okay? We got that? Secure all access, regardless of location, least privilege, strictly enforce, log all access traffic. Okay. So when you look at the bigger timelines, we're in 2022 up here. And we're basically saying, according to CISA, hey, we recognize it's a long journey in a relatively short period of time. Now you may say, hey, one year is gone on the calendar, the fiscal calendar is a little bit different. We all know that. Uh, but you got 2023 and 2024. So if you are sitting here in 2022, you're somewhere in Q3 right now, fiscally, calendar year in Q2, you're over here. Is this a lot of time to get stuff done? I would tell you, my experience would say, no, you should be accelerating by now. You should be accelerating. Now, maybe some of the smaller agencies, you get your stuff all wrapped up and tied with a bow. Congratulations, I applaud you. But if you're one of the larger agencies and, you don't need, and you're behind on your inventory management for applications, machine connections, where all your devices are, et cetera, and or you have large 
inventory of legacy systems, you will have a hell of a lot of work to do. Okay. I highlight this just to say that I put this in here because the CISA directives under this include threat hunting. So I want you all to be aware of this. You cannot isolate within your agencies anymore. You must share your data. And CISA under public law 116-283 section 1705, I like to be specific, allows threat hunting by CISA on all federal executive branch um, agencies without prior authorization. CISA threat hunting on your networks and your systems without or your prior notice. Please be aware you will be tested. And they will provide not only reports to your agency, but also to the President's Council as well as OMB. It's that simple. We have no choice in our federal government if we're going to protect ourselves from all of the very specific and maybe non-specific threats that we're surrounded by as a country today. Okay, Dave, back to you. There we go. So appreciate that. And we'll get to, you want to uh, pop this open? My biggest challenge with Zero Trust is, first of all, figuring out what is this thing. And that's why I love the way that Joe brings it. He does a great job, doesn't he, everybody? And uh, you can pick as many as you want in here. Uh, because it can't, might not just be one, it might be multiples of this, right? So, really appreciate that. Hit the next slide for me, Joe, and we'll uh, and I'll I'll pop I'll pop up a couple other things here because there's a couple of things. Um, wow, there's a, do me a favor if you would put any of your questions or or comments that you want for everybody else to pop pop that into the Q and A so that everybody can see it because it gets crazy crazy with this many people in the chat, which is awesome. Awesome having everybody, right, Joe? Yeah. All right. So uh, there's a bunch of things here. It says, um, I don't think there's a single solution for zero trust. We have to build plans to integrate multiple technical solutions to bring about zero trust mode of operations. What do you think of that? Some of those technical approaches may be limited to a single pillar, while others span multiple pillars. That comes from Timothy. I think that is money. Don't you, Joe? Yes, it is. All right. Uh, some fail to realize that DT, while buzzword is not new, if organizations are securing their infrastructure, too often they forget to start with their policies and go straight for the one-stop shop solution. Hakeem, on fire. Absolutely. Um, let's see. Email me. Spread, uh, Shantanu. Okay. Shantanu is saying, hey, they, there's a spreadsheet version of that available. If you'd like, you can email Shantanu. Uh, fully agree with Hakeem. This is this is a change on how we build the chain of trust, but is not a change in the fundamentals of uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Many of us have been focusing on the enhancements to identify for quite a while. Correct. Yeah, I hope so. So, so uh, Lene, your answer, the answer to your question is people, the human factor, users, uh, insider, insider threat. Uh, excessive permissions. You'll probably get to that at the end. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then uh, least privilege access will minimize insider threat. That is correct. Let's see if we have any other questions here in the Q&A. What does least privilege actually mean from Matthew Van Wallen? Go ahead with that one, Joe. Well, least privilege is exactly what it says. It means that it doesn't matter what you're trying to do. There's no supernumeraries. It doesn't matter who you are. You can't get a high level access for access at the same time to multiple applications. So for, exa for example, if you're just a user for say an SAP or any other business application your agency uses, it means that you only get the access and the privileges to access what you need to do to do your job. You don't that's get right. more. You don't get super right. accesses that you don't need. And it also means that's what least privilege is, the least amount of privilege you need to do your job in your session. And it also means that as soon as you've done that job and your session is done, you're kicked off. You, and if you go away and you get a, if you, you leave that application, you have to, it automatically logs you off. That's what you want to have implemented. And then if you come back to that application again later in the day or even 15 minutes later, you have to re-log on and re-verify yourself. Gotcha. 
And and Matthew is a government contractor. Is this information even relevant to us? Great question. Wow, I can't believe you asked that question. Of course it is. <laughs> of course it is. Let me put it to you this way. If you are a government contractor and you are working in a government agency, it's applicable to you. If you That's are right. a government contractor working for a government agency and you're sitting in their agency building and you're sitting on their device and using their device on their network, it is applicable to you. If you are a government contractor and you're sitting in your own company's building and you're on your own device from that company and you're connected to a government agency network, it applies to you. It's that simple. If you do That's work with the federal government, it applies to you. That's exactly right. I'm going to give and, you another 10, 10 and, seconds for, I'm sorry, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, I got to say this. And if the company you work for wants to say that it is a valid and safe organization to do work with the federal government, you should be doing it within your own company, regardless of who your clients are, federal or commercial. It's that simple. Okay. Sorry. You got excited. There you go. <laughs> and uh, Zach says, uh, how can we implement ZTA in the cloud? The same way you do it outside of the cloud. The cloud, is, what is a cloud? A cloud is a data center and servers and business systems and human beings accessing those assets in a remote data center. That's the cloud. So... <sighs> As you look at ZTA, ZTA extends not just to the physical assets and data centers of your agency, but it extends by law to all of your suppliers. Wow. So that That's includes big. Google and Microsoft and uh, SAP and Salesforce and uh, Amazon. And they should be val verifying and validating their implementation of ZTA or they can't sell to you. As a matter of fact, if you, we, if you dig into uh, the directives by OMB, it says it has to extend out to the federal procurement to all suppliers. And I understand, I just saw a news flash yesterday that a council of federal CISOs has just reviewed a set of languages for to go into the, the federal procurement new contract languages for suppliers related to the executive order. So I haven't had a chance to pull that up yet because I just saw the news flash last night, but I will take a look at that. That's awesome. Uh, that's good stuff. And Kenneth is saying, what are important audit questions you should ask for an organization implementing ZTA? Well, the first thing is you ask, have you, do you have an, an ETA, a ZTA strategy? That's number one. Number two, are, are you implementing it? Yes. How far along are you? Yes. Do you have an inventory of all your applications? Yes. Or no. Do you have an inventory of all of your physical access devices at the endpoints and the networks and the, the phones and the PCs and the iPads and all the rest of that? Yes. Do you know who all of your users are? Yes or no. Do you know who all your supplier connection points are? Yes or no. Do you have ZTA language in all of your contracts? Yes or no. I can keep going on forever, guys. This is yeah. logic, right? It it's it's logic, but what happens is is once you start down the down the trail, it starts to unfold in and of, in and of itself, don't you think? It does, and that's part of the implementation challenge. And as I go forward, we're going to speak a little bit about what are some of your challenges in, in dealing with zero trust. And I will tell you that the challenge. I'll, I'll jump ahead. Forgive me for jumping ahead, Dave. <laughs> the challenge is not esoteric technology. The challenge is. And within your agencies and across the federal government, having commonality in your governance and your policies for this, have a strategic intent in your architectures for your business systems and your use of IT to support ZTA, embrace the philosophy of ZTA. Now that's all culture, guys. That's the culture challenge. The physical challenge is not technology or things we don't know how to do. The physical challenge is logistics. It's the logistics of inventorying and keeping track of all of your IT assets, all of your identities, all your connection points, et cetera, et cetera. That's the logistical challenge. It's about, you know, 
you can look at it and say, wow, I need a new mountain. No, you don't need a new mountain. Take what you have. You have to do it one small shovel full at a time. You got to dig your way throughout. And then it's the same. Once you've agreed on your design and architecture and the tools you're going to use to verify your credentials and your trust, et cetera, um, and your, your, your privileges that you're giving out to people or starting to take them away because they don't need them anymore. It's just the same thing over and over and over again for every identity. On every access, every business system, every device. It, it, a lot of agencies. It's, it's that simple, but it's also that daunting because it's just a lot of stuff to yeah. double check, right? Okay. And a lot of agencies have been working through components of this for decades, even. I, sure I know when I first got into this years ago, uh, it is incredible just identifying just the people that are associated with specific with those specific tasks what should they have access to that and is a, that's a daunting task in and of itself it is and not just the people but also your machine to machine connection points your application yep. application connection points on moving information and stuff back and forth but that goes back to one of the questions that we saw early on on the, on, on the slides that you put up dave uh, I can't remember who asked that question, but it was about uh, ICAM, Identity and Credential Access Management in the federal government. Well, ZTA is a part of ICAM. Yep. Least privilege access controls under your overall strategic umbrella for ICAM. Love it. All right, that's what I got for right now. That's, some folks were asking about, um, about whether this presentation is available. Yes, in fact, you can just click on that and 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 gain access to that through the GovBrief website, number one. And number two, it is being recorded for your entertainment pleasure. How you like that, Joe? <laughs> so now you have to figure out if I'm a comedian or if I'm a dramatic actor. Okay. <laughs> All right, you're up. Am I up? Yep, you're up. Keep going. Okay, so Back I see the percentages here, presidential meeting aid agencies. Now you're starting to get into the flow of things here. Impact on your job role, 22%. I have no idea. Uh, impact on any of your job roles, because I don't know who you are and what your roles are, right? But, you know, the idea that you may be looking for resources or you're getting understanding, this is cool, right? So, okay, let's see if I can get this to go forward. So as I started to jump ahead, um, your challenge is, is, is culturally and, and policy-wise um, defining implicit trust versus zero trust, right? So the old style is in ways of doing things was implicit trust. Once you logged on, I, I validated you today. I trust you today. I trust you all day. I trust you all night. <laughs> and if you didn't log off and we didn't kick you off the network, we probably trust you tomorrow morning. No, zero trust says I don't trust. Validate, validate. Um, is a challenge about rebuilding a replacement with, with cloud, I would tell you that's an overall architectural strategy or a service strategy. Um, but I've already spoken to the idea that just because you're focused on zero trust doesn't mean you're a supplier or your supplier's suppliers or your supplier's mm -hmm. supplier's suppliers mm -hmm. are. Okay? So let's give you um, an example of what I mean by that. Um, Microsoft Azure. I don't know how many of your agencies are using Microsoft Azure or um, Amazon Cloud, web cloud services, et cetera. But in part of my career, I was the chief security officer for Atos. Now, some of you may know Atos, some of you may not, but the number, depending on where you are, the number one or the number three outsourcing provider for legacy and cloud services in the world. Okay, so let's look at AWS and let's look at, I'll just use Azure or Microsoft. Who are the people and what badges do they wear in the Azure cloud data centers? Atos. Atos staffed the Azure cloud data centers for Microsoft. So why do I say that? That's neither good nor bad. All I'm saying today is that it's not just verify who your first tier of supplier is, but who are their suppliers and who are their suppliers and who are their subcontractors? Okay. Um, yes, it's going to take investments depending on where you sit. It's going to take people training and skills to get you there. Of course, all the modernization of cybersecurity. I already talked about, can you trust your suppliers? You should never upfront say, I trust my suppliers. Validate, verify, audit, 
Are they SOC compliant or not? Security operations controls compliant, which is what I think the other gentleman was asking about. Um, one of your challenges is, you know what? I think we're starting to move towards a consensus around maturity models and targets. When this started, no, there's lots of different ways to do that. And that's still a challenge is that you'll have multiple different types of implementations in different agencies. If the world was perfect, there'd be one cookbook, there'd be one solution, everyone would use it, right? Okay, uh, but it doesn't exist. It's a multi-year dedicated program office. It is a, por I talked about logistics. It's a portfolio of portfolios of programs and projects to get you there. Uh, there is a large uh, matrix of agency and reporting requirements to track where you're going. That is just, it is just the, 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 the reality of doing business in our federal government. There are so many agencies and so many places and so many people involved. It's a lot of communications and tracking. Supply chain, software services, and maturity. I talked about that. Flat networks versus micro segmentation. If you dig into executive orders and all the guidance and strategies, et cetera, coming out of the Department of Defense, CISA, et cetera, NIST, OMB. There is a section in there that talks about flat networks versus micro-segmentation. So if anyone on the in the audience today has a background in networks, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, many of our networks have, in, in the commercial sector as well as federal government, have migrated for ease of access ease of access to flat networks. The unfortunate byproduct of flat networks is, is that if you are breached at any one aspect or point of entry into your network, lateral movement of bad actors and their bad stuff flashes to your network and infects everything almost instantaneously. Whereas micro-segmentation puts bridges and moats and chains and blocks and roadblocks and traps across uh, having smaller sets of networks and then passing and verifying controls and access across segmentation in your networks, slowing down the propagation of bad actors. Okay, uh, no more single side on, sorry guys. That was been the, you know, I spent so much time as, as in, in my life on, on the, um, the, the defense industry, then in consulting and services, then I went corporate again and so on and so forth. And I remember the, the decades of mantra is, why do I have to sign in 17 times today? This is a pain in the ass. I can't deal with this all the time. Make it easy, single sign on. So everyone was selling single sign on. Well, guess what? Oh, it's a, it's a terrible security posture. Okay, that's enough said. All right. And then the other thing I will tell you is always beware of vendor claims. I don't care if, if you're a supplier, you're a federal uh, uh, IT contractor out there in the audience today. It's okay. Trust nobody. Always double check and verify vendor claims versus reality. I'm sorry, that's just the fact of life, okay? There's an old saying, you remember what the old, some of the old sayings was, how do you know when a lawyer's you know, lying to you and their lips are moving? Well, how do you know when a software vendor is lying to you? It says when the marketing person is talking to you, okay? Hey, 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 hey. Hey, 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 all right. <laughs> Uh, I say that in jest, you just, everybody sort of like today enhances what they tell you your stuff can do. No way. Not or not, no. Says, can't. Trust nobody. Okay. <laughs> so let me move on, get, get, get moving here because it's your lunch hour for many people, okay? Uh, or not, or right after lunch, you got other meetings to go to. Things are never as good as or as bad as they first appear. It, it's just the way it is. When you first look at this and it's daunting, you go, oh, my God, I can tell you for a fact, it's not as bad as you think it may be, but it's also not as good. <laughs> so start digging in. All right. So zero trust is dependent upon government op uh, governance, operations, discipline and continuous monitoring. So when, again, I'm going to highlight asked about ICAM. It is asset configuration, patch management, user process, machine identity management user process and machine access management and segmentation. Now, why did I separate out machine identity management and access management? I separate those two things out is because they are actually two different disciplines. 
The world of suppliers and software have been selling identity and access management solutions in big consulting houses forever. We have an IAM solution. Well, let me tell you, they're two different things. Track identities and then track access, okay. And user, application process, process to process, application to application, and machine to machine connection access requests, okay. Okay, DOD has put out a significant amount of guidance that has been embraced by CISA and NIST on non-person identities and person identities. The references are at the bottom of the slide. You can find them in their documents. The zero trust reference architecture from DOD and maturity model has been embraced by NIST and CISA. I'm not going to give a lesson today on maturity models, but I'm flashing this up to let you know it exists. It gives you guidance to help you understand what your maturity level may or may not be and where you need to start, okay? And as always, it highlights that the challenge is always moving from concepts to reality. This is directly out of the zero trust reference architecture from DOD, the Joint Information Agency, uh, Systems Agency, and a National Security Agency combined their staffs to work and produce these reference architectures and guidelines for you. Go get a copy. It's that simple. Okay. So. I think that answers the stuff is stuff out there. Least privilege uh, principle is that the idea of any user program or process should only have the bare minimum privileges necessary to perform its function. You only allow enough access to perform a task. And where is it applied? Everywhere. Everywhere. User, systems, process, networks, database, applications, and equipment and devices. So this is where I talked about the complexity of logistics, it's lots of stuff you need to inventory and track. Dig it out. If you've got these inventories, you're way ahead of the game. If you don't, you got to go start from scratch. It's like it's zero-based budgeting and validate that they all exist. If you want to understand the complexity, I don't know how many uh, Project Management Institute members are here or uh, how many of you may be project management professionals having attained that certification as I have during my career. And if you are a PMI, PMP today, and you do not recognize this formula, I am ashamed of you. And I'm saying that is because I know this formula and its meaning is on the PMP exam. N times N minus one divided by two tells you the number of communications and connection channels you will have in any project based on the number of people and moving parts in that project. It is directly applicable. You can actually quantify the complexity of your challenge in facing and moving forward and inventorying all of your assets for ZTA that must go under control. Okay, so if you want to just say it's, it's bigger than a bread box, well, you don't have to say it's bigger than a bread box. You can actually go out there and quantify it. Okay, the other challenge in communications is, and the guidance is all there, portfolios of programs and projects and portfolios and programs and projects, OMB 53, OMB 300 has been around forever. How to track this from a program office perspective exists. These are just examples I've used maybe 15 years ago for OMB 300 reporting when I was working with several of your federal our federal agencies. Okay, I don't want to go into each of these, but this is more on program project management. It's there, it exists, it hasn't changed. Okay. Um, this may be slightly outdated because the last time I looked at this was last month, but if you want to go out there and understand where the money is and how much money is involved in IT and the federal government, uh, it's published on the IT dashboard.gov. Uh, what is the federal government? We're talking about across our federal government, we're going to surpass $100 billion. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money out there. And the executive order of OMB says, reprioritize your existing funding as well as submit for new funding. That option is there, okay? I've had some questions come up in past webinars about fit and tick, and I will tell you that yes, 
nothing changes. Where does in the in the in the uh, modernization of cybersecurity and federal government does the trusted internet connection policies and GSA's furniture and information technology program for acquiring um, assets and connections and stuff, so on and so forth for your networks. It all exists and it's still all applicable. It doesn't ZTA. And the executive order doesn't replace any of this other guidance. Okay. So information technology, IT portion of the FIT program still applies as does, uh, you know, what's covered, laptops, so on and so forth. Okay. What I will tell you is that, as I, as I said, GSA has a mandate on the executive order and by OMB to update their language for contracting, for services, equipment, so on and so forth, anything in IT to reflect a supplier or vendor's implementation and ability to meet the ZTA requirements as defined previously. Okay, um, it's all there. It'll be in the deck. I don't think I have to read through this. Um, key takeaways, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So it may seem like it's really a big deal. It is, but it's logistically a big deal. I don't think knowing what to do is the big deal. I think the big deal is just actually doing it and digging your way through this and getting there. And that zero trust will not be the same for everybody. It all depends on who your suppliers are, who, what your data centers are, what your legacy business systems are, how you will overcome them or you'll wrap them and protect them, okay? Um, and that was pretty much um, wrapping us up. And Dave, I, I think we talked about going back to the, the, the earlier slides and specific requests that people had, but I'm going to close up. Where do you go from here? Uh, for this webinar's purposes, you establish your scope. I, obviously, from the surveys that we've done today during the webinar, a lot of you have already started. Great. Keep going. If you're not that far along, get started. Establish your scope. Know what you're going to do. Know who your vendors are. Make sure you understand your CMDB inventory, all of those points that have identities that connect and talk to each other, formulate your strategy and start moving forward in your adoption plans, okay? Um, Dave, did you wanna go into this poll? Yeah, I'll pop that open. Uh, it's really just to figure out where do you want, what do you wanna do from here? You can continue the conversation. Joe and, and other folks uh, from Divine can certainly assist with this. Um, and so let us know it, how you want to handle that. And there's a lot of folks that said right out of the gate, they wanted to talk with, with you guys some more specific to their agencies. That's what we're here for. That's what you're here for. And, uh, and, and we can certainly, certainly help facilitate that from, from our side. Really appreciate the, the data dump, the knowledge transfer, Vulcan mind meld, whatever you want to call this thing. <laughs> we really appreciate you doing that, uh, Joe. And, um, if you have, we also have a couple of questions. Uh, let's see what we got here. I don't know that I have any more. If you have a question, put it in the queue. Pop to the next slide for me, will you? Just uh, so that they, everybody reminds everybody. That's it. Yep. Participation is easy. Um, uh, Matthew is asking that question again. How does this relate to CMMC? Is one well, of the it fits with it. So, so let me answer that one. So when we start talking about the cybersecurity maturity model and certifications, it obviously fits within CM, uh, CMCC. It's not separate from CMCC. Cybersecurity is all about where do you fit, what is your risk profile, et cetera, on the maturity model. This fits within as a component of overall cybersecurity maturity today. And not just, I, I, I don't want to make this all, make it sound like it only applies to the federal government because that's not true. That's right. Everybody I know in the world today is challenged by everything that you are all challenged by from a security perspective. Every commercial organization I know of is saying, hey, listen, it doesn't matter if I do work with the federal government or not. ZTA, okay, is the golden ring of the future, is one component of the gold rings to help protect our organization. Yep. And Max is asking, is an SDVOSB, service disabled vendor owned small business, services provider, do I need to be ZTA certified? So I don't even know what a ZTA certification is yet. I yeah. think it will fall under and be included in CMMC. However, uh, it's the language in the executive order and the OMB directives is pretty clear. If you do business, 
you will be compliant. You do business with the federal government, you are affected by this. You must be able to say, this is how I'm meeting ZTA requirements on my connection points to your systems. And that's every everybody that's touching from anywhere. And, and I know you're gonna answer the question that you had for everybody earlier, which is how, what, what's, what's the biggest issue? So did anybody put in any answers? So somebody- uh, Yeah, I'll, I'm gonna answer, I'll, I'll go back through them in just a minute. Uh, John Wallman's asking, whoa, hold on. That's why we don't do this in chat. What's the best commercial tools for implementing and automating ZTA? Okay, I hate to burst your bubble. There are no- Automation tools. There's no single solution out there. It's not how it works. Everything we talked about today says, you know what? You can't buy this out of the box. You just can't. It, there is no vendor solution for this. Now, and if you go to the consulting houses and the contractors and say, I have a solution, and then you'll find all the components they want to wrap into this, that's fine. But you cannot go out and buy it from Amazon in a shrink wrap box and plug in a CD or download a software file. And Clinton's actually saying something like that. <laughs> um, Thank you. <laughs> that there's definitely stating that there's no ZTA solution in a box can remove the potential that innovative technologies can be accessed to help solve this challenge. I don't think that's what Joe's saying, <laughs> Clinton. Um, there are, there are technologies that you're going to implement as part of your ZTA framework, right? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, anything that has to do with access management and identity management, how you look at stuff, look at privileges and then, and then test and recertify that, hey, I know this is so-and-so from this particular endpoint, and this is how I verify who this identity is or machine identity, et cetera. Yes. And All those tools put together, it's it's the philosophy of how you put them together and use them. And okay. That's exactly right. And don't, and, don't and, and Hakeem's saying, don't let the vendors con you. Absolutely. You, the vendors want to sell their stuff. Abs and, and guess what? Their stuff is good. It's not that their stuff isn't good. It's no. just verify where it fits in into your internal processes, right, Joe? It's not a matter yeah. of just yeah. saying, oh, there's no, first of all, there is no silver bullet, right? Yep. And there's no, no pixie dust there's either. No there's, there's no bibbity boppity boo. We're not going down that road. There isn't a way to get there. But there that way, you don't don't chase, don't chase a technology to fit it. Chase what the technology can do to your internal it, processes so that it will put you in to compliance with ZTA. That's what you're talking about, right, Joe? And that is, I like the way you stated that, and, and I forgive me for not having stated it that way already today, because uh, I know I did in the other webinars we gave. The first thing I would be looking for is to inventory all my identities, and then looking at those identities and making sure I understood and I had my categories of how I was verifying those identities. And then saying my philosophy of being compliant with zero trust is least privilege per access control. That's two things, privileges and then sessions, right? You only log in for your session, get your task and you're logged out. Then, then look at the tools you have in place for identity and access management, or identity and credentialing and access management ICAM, and look how your existing tools can be used to accomplish, okay, or meet your policy goals. It's not yeah, about agree. finding new tools. I agree. And Leah is saying, if an agency is already meeting one or more of the stated goals, it is, a, is it sufficient to report that the status of for compliance with the EO, executive order? Wherever, wherever you are, you're required to report your status. Now, whether you're asking right. me if it's sufficient, I don't know if you're reporting it's sufficient or not, but if you're meeting the stated goals, okay, report them. It's that simple. And the language in, 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 in the executive order and the OMB guidance is, if you cannot meet it, tell us why and what your plans are to get there and when. If you go to the OMB document, which I have read, okay, it has language that says our target goals and timelines for you are, you must report your status on or before that is these, you know, timelines we've put in place and tell us you've met it 
or you can't, and if you can't, tell us why and when you will. That's how you make progress on such large initiatives. Mm, good stuff. All right. Um, I think there's a couple of things to, to respond to for Mr. Groves in there. Got Love it. Thank you. Mr. Groves was already on it when I said that. Fantastic. All right. I'll pop to the next thing for me, Joe. I think we did pretty good so far, don't you? Yep, account types, bolster knowledge, yes, the stuff is out there. Agencies, yes, it fits within ICAM. How long for government agencies? Uh, it takes you out to 2024. Uh, is it included a CDM? Hey, listen, I don't know who asked this question, Wilbert. I don't know what you mean by CDM. Is it copy data management, collaboration and document management, cloud data migration, configuration data management? Which one is it? Great question. <laughs> so if but you again, have that. I don't see ZTA being part of any other package. It's, ZTA is about identity and access management. If it's about a strategy around uh, how you're doing like CMMC or other things, yes, it's a component of it, but it's the philosophy, the governance and implementing least privilege in, in, in per session, okay? If CDM means configuration data management for you, you need CDM data management, hopefully to be keeping track of your inventories. Now, most implementations of CDM I know of stick to software and physical assets not identity. So, you know, the combination of identity and access management, as well as configuration data management together, combined to give you your inventory of where you can potentially find all your identities and your points of connection. Impact on ZTA, yes. Uh, now or before, tell us, yes. And is there a reference architecture? Yes, so I think we covered those. So in regards, just real quick with legacy systems, because some legacy systems go way back and some even mainframe, right? So you're, as, as modernization comes, then you know th there's also implications on the modernization practices and the processes too. Yes, the there are. Systems, and, and the directives within the overall modernization program, non-specific to ZTA, is that if you have, uh, legacy systems, et cetera, before investing in extreme amounts of money and maintaining your legacy systems, start planning your migration to cloud services and suppliers. Yep, I agree. All right, pop up the next one. Great job on that. I appreciate that. Um, so any other questions, let us know. Let's see if there's there one just popped in. Earlier you mentioned you do not view SSO favorably. What aspect of SSO do you dislike? One size fits all? From Bruce. No, well, single sign-on says ma maximum. Okay, the philosophy behind single sign-on is um, violates the ZTA principle of per session identity verification. Mm -hmm. Okay, single sign-on says log in once, log into everything. So let's look at the most the way most agencies and commercial organizations implement identity management. Okay, you log into your, you, you, you power up your laptop, you put in a password, done. That gets you access to start up your disk drive and power up the operating system. Then you log into the operating system. The log, it may or may not be automated. Once your, your, your laptop is booted up, you then have to verify your connection and identity and log into your network. Okay, and then if you want to log, once you're into your network, um, do you actually have to log into or not, or is it all automated to get access to a remote disk drive or a remote SharePoint? Or now I want to get into Salesforce or an ERP system or a personnel system, et cetera, then you should be logging into that other business application. Single sign-on was designed specifically as a set of solution sets to say, hey, this is identity, I'll test you once and then I'll give you carte blanche to get anything that we have in our database says that you may or may not have the rights to get to all at once, single sign-on. Never sign in again. Single sign-on in principle violates zero trust. Zero trust philosophy, concepts, philosophy and implementations are all about least privilege, access per session. 
I was talking with a CISO uh, one time and they said, listen, would if you logged into your bank account and you just and just decided to walk away and just didn't carry it around everywhere you went open. Would you ever do that? No, you would never do that. Right. That's, you would never do that with your own checking account. Why do you do it with your federal government that, access? Right. Exactly. And, I'll give you and an that was the point. So at one point. point within a very large organization I was a security officer at, uh, I walked around headquarters building and I was noticing that somewhere around 1130, everybody's desk started emptying out. Yet, everybody's laptops were open. Some may not even have, the, the screens would still be live. They may not have a, you know, even a slideshow running on top of them, right? But what really torqued me off was we had identity cards that you had to plug in that were part of your token to validate you for your single sign-on. Okay, <laughs> I'm not. I did single sign. I certainly did in a lot of commercial organizations. So you had your identity card, your token card. You put it into the side of your, of your machine, and it was part of the validation of your credentialing or who you were. You couldn't log on unless you had your credentials plugged in, right? Okay. So I was walking around headquarters building, and in another country over in Europe, and everybody was getting up and going to lunch. And they were leaving their laptops powered up with their credential card plugged in. So it became my yeah. habit that every time I walked by a desk and I saw a laptop or, or a desktop open with a credential card sitting there and the owner wasn't sitting at that keyboard, I would pull the credential card and put it in my pocket. And by the end of the day, I'd have all these credential cards and it would usually take an hour or two before the embarrassed people could filter up their chain of command in their management to figure out what the hell was going on. And they'd report that they lost their identity access. And then they'd have to call us and it would eventually get to me. And I would say, please come to my office. Okay. And Jack, Jack, Jack chances. I've seen it almost all the time when I walk around. Well, then start unplugging people's stuff and, and picking up their laptops and taking them off their desks. There you go. All right, advance for the next slide for me. So don't forget, we still had that question I asked. But that's right. I'm going to go back in just a second and, and, and get some of the answers. I did read some of them before. Uh, let me go back up there. The question was, that wasn't what was your favorite TV show when you were a kid. That was my question. Uh, the, the the question was... The source um, of of uh breaches identity breaches data breaches etc if, if i just want to see what people think it is so you gotta you gotta scroll way up to see um, let's see it has not to even do looking with at you. Go ahead. people the human factor users insider threat excessive permissions spear phishing human error and that's ah. a double tap brian no fair it's, it's humans it's people and it's fishing whether it's spear fishing or general fishing. There it is. Brian it. had it. <laughs> so, so that's awesome. So by the end of the day, you'll get a recap email with a video of this recording. And that way you can refer to it. Uh, you also have the session docs, which you also have now, but you'll have that as well. And then a request, if you want to request for a one-on-one -on -one meeting with, with, with Joe's team, uh, we'll be glad to help facilitate that. Sure. At least the email will. And then if you can pop on the last thing there, Let's see what we got. Joe Lazlo wasn't here. I did my best to fill in as the best I could, Joe. So uh, you did okay. B plus. I'll give you a B plus there, Dave. Uh, B All right, we'll take it. All right. So we, uh, but if you need to reach out to Joe, got his information there. Uh, if there's anything else, please just reach out to the the bottom emails with the phone numbers, and we'll make sure that you guys can um, get what you need. Well, we appreciate hey. you joining us, Joe. Great stuff. Always awesome and appreciate the update on the latest information because a lot of folks are still confused, man. I appreciate it. Yep, yep. Not a problem. Happy to uh, to share. And uh, please don't hesitate to drop an email. If you send an email, we will respond. I will respond personally. Uh, it's not going to go into a queue and have some junior staff member respond to you. Trust me, it will come directly to my personal email account and I will respond. It may take me a day or two to respond to you, but I will respond. It, it, it takes you two days to respond because you're using dual factor authentication. 
That's not <laughs> true. It doesn't take two days. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks much. Appreciate it. Uh, Joe, take care. Appreciate Thanks for sharing the, the, the pictures too. Be good. All right. Likewise. See you.